I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to the republic for which it stands. One nation, one nation under, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, let's have roll call, please. Okay, uh, Chairperson Jan Clark Kretz. Here. Bonnie London. Here. Ryan Demartini. Here. Jared Taylor. Here. Eden Lee. Here. Jean Wilson. Here. M Miguel Yukovich. Here. Auxiliary member Beth Williams Roscoff. And auxiliary member Ramona Brockman. Here. Great. Sounds like the train is here too. Always. Sorry, I muted myself. Um, <laughs> uh, now it's time for committee comment for items not on the agenda. Does anybody on the committee have anything they would like to comment on? Not on the agenda. Okay. Is there any public comment for items not on the agenda? You're muted, Mary Beth. <laughs> At this time, if there are any attendees in the public uh, audience that would like to comment for items not on the agenda, please raise your hand. Seeing none. Okay, now is the time for us um, to adopt the agenda. Is there any in the committee that would like to make a motion to adopt our agenda for today? I move, move to adopt, adopt it. Agenda. Second. Okay, so I have the motion by Ryan, is that right? And then a second by? Miguel. Miguel. Okay, awesome. And then roll call, please. Yes, um, Jen Clark Kretz. Yes. Bonnie London? Yes. Ryan Demartini? Yes. Jared Taylor? Yes. Eden Lee? Yes. Gene Wilson? Miguel Yukovich? Yes. Okay. okay uh, so now we're going to move on to the cons consent agenda, which is um, the minutes of our last meeting. Um, and I actually had a question myself about that. Um, does anybody else have any questions about the consent agenda? No. Um, I just wanted to confirm that we had no public comment. We had no comments from people outside of this committee for this, for these minutes. So for the first meeting, for the first meetings, how those went, Jan, when I was very first directed on the first meetings was that we were doing items of discussion. And so on the first couple of meetings, that's how it, is, how it reflects. And on all the subsequent meetings, um, beginning probably with the meetings next week, we will list everybody by name like we do at council meetings. Okay, perfect. Okay. So those are all the, all the comments that were brought up. They were just not named in these. Okay. And, so, and then, and then we, have, we have a recording of this, of this meeting. Okay. All and right. Again, notice on the on the upcoming consent agendas based on that same idea is I mean on the um, minutes is that I on the minutes themselves I place the link to the video so you don't have to search for it you can just click straight on that that meeting and that recording if you have any questions on it. Oh, that's perfect! What a great idea. Thanks, Carol. That's no really good. helpful. All right. All right, so I guess at this point, I would need a motion to uh, approve our consent agenda. So moved. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Who was that? That was uh, Miguel Jared. Was Jared. right? Jared. Oh, uh, I had Eden as a second. Oh, Eden, okay. Who was it Eden? Sorry. Yeah, <clears throat> this is Eden. I, I seconded. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, right. person Jan Clark Kretz. Aye. Bonnie London. Yes. Ryan D. Martini. Yes. Jared Taylor. Yes. Eden Lee. 
Yes. Dean Wilson? Yes. Miguel Yukovich? Yes. Thank you. All right, let's move on to uh, committee matters. And we'll go to Mary Beth. Yes, so as, as Jan said, thank you all for being here and welcome to our second meeting of this committee. Um, we're going to forego introductions because we've been through that before. And we're gonna turn it over to Mark Teague uh, from PlaceWorks to provide us the scoop. Save your comments for after his presentation. Uh, we will open it up for committee discussion afterwards and then open to public comment and then back to the committee. Thank you, Mary Beth. You're welcome, Mark. Uh, all right, let's see if I can do this. I've been having wonderful computer issues all day. When I say wonderful, I mean they suck. Uh, but uh, please bear with me. Uh, I don't have AT&T, thankfully, but I wasn't the first to say that. All right, can you see my screen, everyone? Yeah. Yes. Outstanding. At least one thing's going right. All right, let me fire this up. So today what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk a little bit about land uses. We, we started that last week and I've done a little research and I have a call into the city of Vallejo on, I think it's Vallejo, maybe it's Vacaville, on uh, the horse uh, hotel ranch combination because I wanna get some more information for the subcommittee to talk about. It was something that was raised at the last uh, subcommittee meeting and I wanna make sure that we get as much information as we can. Uh, I have a line on that. Thank you. Things are looking up. I have coffee. Um, I have uh, I have an in on the in that community, so I'm able to get to some of the staff reports and find out of uh, how they managed to come about. And I hope to report back to the subcommittee uh, before next time uh, in writing or at next time if if need be. Um, we need to be focusing on the 10,000 foot level. Um, I, I like that we're talking a little bit about uses and I know we can't divorce the two. We really need to talk about them together. Um, but let's try not to get into, well, this would be a good place for a Cabela's or this would be a good place for Joe's Fly Shop. Um, let's just get into broad categories of land uses. And I really want us to talk about how the adjacent, uh, adjacent uses work together. Uh, one of the ideas, and I think it was Bonnie uh, sent a, a photo and some ideas on uh, places that she had traveled to that had complementary uses. So there might have be some commercial, but there might also be some boutique, uh, hotel, uh, or bed and breakfast type of arrangement. So it was a reason to stop and stay. If people just go through a drive through and leave your community, that's not really providing much benefit. Um, and we have places for that. Um, there's lots of places for that up and down the freeway. Although the city manager might say, yes, Mark, but they're making sales tax, but we'll get into that later. But if instead we can get them to stop and, and linger a little bit and really enjoy the town, then I think we have achieved something truly magical and worthwhile. Um, let's try not to get into individual properties, although we may not be able to avoid that in some cases. Um, and we want to make sure that we're not looking at projects that come up, and I realize that will probably be a topic for uh, this evening's meeting. So where we are is uh, the subcommittees have all met once. Thank you all for that. Again, I also wish to uh, echo my appreciation for you all being here and particularly for the history. It's really hard as a consultant to come into a community and understand the feeling of what's going on. And so when you do uh, get on a little bit on the history of how things got to where they are, that really does help. And I really appreciate that. Um, and I thank the folks that have sent in pictures. Uh, we will compile some of those. Uh, unfortunately, I just got them today and I didn't have time to stuff them into a PowerPoint. I will do that and may reach out to some of you and get some more particulars. Uh, about that. And I love the fact that I think at least one of them is not from the United States, which makes me happy that people are kind of looking outside of themselves to see, hey, I really liked this. Can we emulate that? Uh, and some of that may end up just as a picture in our general plan. So don't feel like, oh, I'm doing this and it's going to be a whole policy page. It may just be, we like this. These are, these are examples of things that the subcommittee and the towns expressed appreciation for. 
there is value to that because then when Mary Beth is at the counter or Andy or Christy is trying to help somebody with an application and they have questions and believe it or not, most developers would rather choose the easy way of making the town happy than the hard way of breaking them over a brick. So if we can say, look, if you can make it look like this, you're gonna get more acceptance, that works. So of course, this is our study area, uh, although uh, we're really focused up by the horseshoe area. Uh, most of what you see on this map likely isn't gonna change a great deal. Uh, what I did was I took the existing land uses and Mary Beth, I apologize right up front that uh, I did this about an hour and a half ago. We had a whole list of all the existing land uses and uh, I summarized them. So uh, that's what we're doing. Um, and we're gonna be talking about policy writing. And I do have a separate PowerPoint for policy writing that we will need to talk about as we're going through changes in those various areas. So here are the goals out of our current land use element. And there's a lot of them, uh, a lot more than we normally have in a contemporary housing element or a housing element. Now you've got me doing it, Mary Beth, uh, in, in a land use element for a general plan. The tradition of late has been to have fewer goals that are just more aspirational. And then we have steps to getting them. Ideally, you know, and some of these are aspirational to predict groundwater and surface water quality. Okay, uh, I understand that that's important. Is that really a goal? Is it something we want to put out there? Um, are there other places in the general plan where that's more appropriate, uh, like in the conservation element? Th those types of things. Certainly, some of these are already ensconced in ordinances or federal and state regulations, but we need to revisit these. I'm gonna pass no judgment on any of them. Um, it would be useful if you look at other general plans in doing your homework and see what they've done for goals as well, uh, because that might give you some uh, inspiration on things that you'd like to see. Mainly, what we would like to do is perhaps talk about goals that are specific to the subcommittee's area of focus. And maybe there's only one or two that are specific to this part of the town. And that's where we should probably focus our writing and our creative input. Um, and so they're here, it's part of the resources and Mary Beth, I'll make sure you get the revised PowerPoint uh, right after this meeting. So these are some of the policies that are specific. Now a policy is a, uh, uh, it's a directive, if you will. It's something that the city will do, shall do or shall encourage. Um, and so they tend to be written that way. They are directive uh, as opposed to an action item, which is something that will be done later or will be used to implement a policy. And like I said, I have a, a, a lengthier PowerPoint that I can share with you as background reading material. And we can certainly go over as a subcommittee if you'd like, but it's, it's really part of a training program that I use for young planners. So you might as well get to see them and, and see what they get to see. Um, but these are the ones that pertain specific to the subcommittee area. And we should probably talk through this and whether, whether they still pertain, whether it's something that the subcommittee would like to change, what those changes might be and what the point of the change is. Because sometimes, I don't know about y'all, but sometimes I'll have a writer's block and I'll say, well, this is what I'm trying to achieve. And then I'll call Christy or Andy and we'll talk things through and suddenly, oh, that's what we're gonna do. Uh, because everybody has a different opinion. Um, and you know, some of these are really awesome. You know, provide a design and appearance that will re reinforce the rural character of Loomis. Uh, as we talked about last time and on several times, what does rural character mean to you? Does that mean everything looks like a barn? I would suggest to you that probably isn't what you mean, but I don't know, maybe it is. Uh, are there things, what, what is rural to you? Um, and I think I told the story in one of the committees about rural sometimes means different things to different people. One of my first places that I worked rural uh, meant a town of 50 or 70,000, just large enough to have a Macy's and a Neiman Marcus. That was rural to them. The town I was living and working in at the time was about 2,800 people. Um, and they considered that too urban. So different definitions for different people. And so here are the land uses. We need to identify the land uses, particularly up around the interchange, which is where we're spending most of our time. Um, if we're going to change the land use, it would be helpful to know why we're changing it. Uh, and sometimes we may not want to change the land use, but we may want to change what's allowed in the land use. 
you understand the distinction? We may decide that one or more of the uses that we're calling out as appropriate for that part of the town may not be appropriate and we should change that. Um, do we need to talk about the edge treatments? If we suddenly have a bunch of activity, even if it's horses, if there are people that live next to it that may not necessarily like that, or if there's unintended consequences. One of my favorites is uh, I had a project in uh, or Orland a few years ago and we preserved olive trees, right? All Orland is known for olives. There are olives everywhere there. And the night of the meeting, we had the developer in line. We had the planning commission in line. We were preserving olive trees as ornamental trees in the middle of the um, subdivision. The agricultural commissioner and a couple of farmers came and re respectfully requested that we not preserve the olive trees. And these are the people we were trying to placate. The reason is, is that apparently if you don't spray the olives regularly and treat them properly, they can harbor pests and uh, vectors that would attack the commercial olive crops. And they were concerned that the types of things that they have to spray on their olives and whatnot to keep that from happening wouldn't be done within the subdivision and therefore uh, would cause this little island of pestilence to end up in the middle of their olive orchard. It was, a, it was an eye-opener for me as a planner, and it was, it was sort of a cautionary tale that sometimes we think it would be good, maybe put in a vineyard. Well, vineyards require maintenance, and that maintenance may not be appropriate for the adjacent use. So just an idea that not all uses are necessarily complementary. Uh, I'm currently uh, working on a general plan where they want as many agricultural uses as possible. And then when I bring up things like agricultural spraying, heavy equipment usage, hazards, chemicals, that starts to sound more like an industrial site than a commercial uh, uh, park, if you will. Anyway, those are the types of things that we'll talk through. There are always solutions for these. So don't feel, well, this is really what I want to see. Great. Let's figure out how to get that. Um, and then, of course, the definitions and when and how land uses should be focused. So here are the goals. Do they still capture the vision of the town? Do they still meet what you need to do? These are really the tasks of the subcommittee and we're not going to worry too much about the homework. You've already done a lot of that. I would like to see some more photos and I will put them together in a PowerPoint presentation. And we can kind of go through those uh, as we move on. That's all I have, Mary Beth. We can start the discussion. Okay, we'll turn it back to the committee um, for discussion. Uh, raise your hand. You'll be asked to unmute and you can begin the discussion. Jan, would you like to start us off? Sure. So um, first of all, I kind of want to make sure that everybody has the documents that they need in order to, um, you know, talk about it and, and also have the paperwork they need. So this map, um, does everybody have access to this map? I want to make sure. Does everybody? Okay. Good. And... Um, it's, it is really clear the difference, the different colors, which are the different um, land uses, that's obvious there. Um, maybe what would be a, a little bit more, what might be helpful is let's start at the freeway and go south and talk about that's the TD areas, right? Mary Beth? Yes, yes, the tourist commercial destination. Yeah. So can you, can we talk about um, what that means in a description and um, the different uses for that particular area? So Mark, if you go back a couple of uh, slides or maybe it's the next slide, it talks about the different land. There you go. I was going for your existing land uses slide uh, after the land use map. That one. So the tourist destination commercial description is here. Intended to accommodate a mixture of office, business park, retail, commercial, lodging, conference center, and other traveler serving uses, local serving entertainment uses, and residential uses as part of mixed use structures. 
Building heights are limited to three stories and not to exceed 45 feet, provided that any height over 35 feet shall require fire department approval. Within this area, site coverage may range from 35% to a maximum of 50%. And the density of residential uses within mixed use projects may range from two to 10 dwelling units per acre. Okay, um, so given that description to the committee, does anybody have any questions about the uses for that particular tourist destination commercial? Miguel? Yes, um, so it allows residential at a rate of two to 10 dwelling units per acre? Correct. That's the general plan existing land use. And your zoning also complements that with two to 10 units per acre in mixed use projects. Well, this is tourist destination. I yeah. don't know if that's termed um, mixed use, but okay, you answered my question, thanks. Uh -huh. so, so Mary Beth, coming, going back to the, the residential question, um, this particular uh, use does allow residential, but it has to be within a mixed use project. Can you explain to the committee what that means? Um, certainly. Um, typically mixed use, if you're talking um, in terms of stories, the ground floor would be commercial, the upstairs would be residential, um, multifamily, it could be um, uh, work live units to complement the downstairs units, uh, any of that kind of nature. The, the goal overall is that you don't have a commercial uh, strip and then separated an apartment complex. They have to be under the same, um, I guess roof would be the right way. <laughs> So just to be clear, there's no residential uses, it's like a single home allowed. It has to be on top of a commercial. No. Retail, right? What's you, you, you could have just multifamily as a standalone. Okay. In, in that zoning category. Okay. And I think I saw somebody else's hand up. Was, um, was Bonnie's hand up? Yeah. yeah. I was also trying to get a little bit more clarity about what the residential within a mixed use project meant. Um, and so I guess now I'm a little confused again because if multi-residential can be a standalone, um, I guess I'm trying to understand the distinction. Jean had her hand up too. Am I unmuted? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, it was my understanding also that there were not to be any residential that were not part of a mixed use structure. And I don't see either how, how a, an apartment complex is a mixed use structure. I think it was meant to be that it was not a just mixed use project. It specifies structure and that would be like over commercial or, or part of a commercial um, or business uh, office or something like that, but it was never intended to be a standalone residential of any kind, much less apartment buildings. And that's where um, the zoning code provides for, oh no, okay, I'm looking in the wrong column, excuse me. Yeah, so multifamily, in a mixed use structure is only allowed in the CT zone. Okay, and where are you getting this information, Mary Beth? What page? This is out of our zoning code, table two dash six. Okay, okay, so to be clear, <laughs> the only way that there can be residential uses within this commercial, this tourist destination commercial is when a, it is a mixed use project. Structure. Correct. Structure. Right. Okay. So the other the other allowable uses within this zone um, related to residential uses, um, home occupations, uh, household pets, 
uh, residential care facilities for the elderly um, on approval of a use permit. So it's the multifamily and the residential care facilities that would be allowed. Okay. Anybody else have their hand up? I yes, saw please. Mark's hand up. Okay. I'm not allowed to raise my hand per the software we're using if I'm presenting. So that's why I had to do the uh, analog <laughs> way. Um, and I was gonna obviously need to clarify what Mary Beth said was that there's a difference between horizontal mixed use, which is simply similar uses on a property and vertical mixed use, which is within a structure, which is what I believe she just explained. So uh, as I understand it, this is limited to uh, vertical mixed use within the structure. Um, and I know everybody's excited about commercial, but don't forget that also includes professional office and service commercial uses. So it may not be, you know, uh, apartments above a bar or apartments above uh, a retail establishment. It may also be above a professional office. Um, and Mary Beth, since you have the code open there, does it also limit the, um, the size of that use? Because one of the things I've, I've seen is you get your commercial use is about 20 by 20, and then the rest of it's all residential. You know, it's a little newsstand or something. Um, I just wondered if, does the whole bottom floor have to be that way? Um, I'm looking. Yeah, no worries. We can come back with that. But that's all okay. I wanted to add, Chair. Okay, Andy, do you have anything to add to that discussion? One of the things, you know, as a existing land use, it doesn't say it's a vertical mixed use. And, and going to your point, Mark, it's something we may want to consider if that's all we're desiring, because you could have a mixed use all on one level uh, in, say, a complex where the buildings are attached. So uh, as planners, we're used to seeing people come in with proposals that interpret the language very explicitly. So take a look at this and just think, what are all the deviations that you could get from this uh, land use description? And Mary Beth, I recall some time ago, a proposal came to the town as kind of a what if proposal. And there was a fair amount of residential in that proposal, but I believe it was all uh, assisted uh, living facilities that were single story, uh, kind of over one third of the project. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. And it was detached from the commercial component. It was, so I mean, that has not moved forward, but it was interesting how that potential landowner interpreted the general plan and zoning. Because it does, it does uh, state that, correct? Correct. Yeah. Right. If, if it pleased the chair, um, let me get into the weeds a little bit. For those of you that are unfamiliar, can you see the zoning code here up on, up on the screen? A little oh, thank you, Mark. Yeah, it is a little small. It's even a little small on my screen. How about this? Is that a little better? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so this is kind of the holy grail. This is this is really the pointy end of the stick. This is where uh, property owners and developers go. This is where planners go to look at what's actually required. This is all online. Uh, there's a link on the town's website. Plus, you can just Google it, which is what I did a few seconds ago. And you can see here are specific use regulations. Across the top here, you'll have different zoning uh, districts and planners refer to these as districts. We re refer to general plan designations as designations. That's a little pro tip right there. So this is the CT area that we're talking about. And when you look at a table like this, um, you will see P for permitted, and these are usually explained up here, right? P for permitted, minor use permit, uh, use permit, uh, permitted with set specific use regulations or not allowed at all. And it means in our vernacular, it's permitted. So you can go down this list of uses. And again, we're trying to stay out of the zoning code because this will be updated later. But I want you to get a feel for what's allowed there uh, within the land use designation. And you can see what the requirements are. So a minor use permit. Now, this is the type of thing that we would be concerned about. Noise, parking, parties weddings, those sorts of things that have the potential to annoy existing uses. That's why you would go with a minor use permit. Uh, a use permit is something that we want to regulate certain things or just be sure we have our finger on. And a permitted use is something that could go in immediately. 
So for example, if I were a crusty old developer and wanted to get past the old mixed use piece, I'd simply make the fitness part of my apartment building uh, on the bottom floor, make it 30 by 30, call it a commercial fitness spot or a club, and I've met your code requirements. So I just want you to roll that around in your head a little bit, but there are always ways of getting around things, which is why most mixed use is a discretionary permit, which requires you to be able to make a decision. And at that point you have some control. So the general plan might have a policy that says mixed use may be horizontal and these are the criteria or may be vertical and these are the criteria. Uh, getting back to Andy's point earlier. Um, and then you can see things are prohibited. So you can't put a school in this zone district. Okay. Um, and you, you can see, and so these are references to your development code. This is not the most illuminating reading. I'll scroll up here so you can look at residential. This is not the most exciting thing to read. Um, this is where planning geeks really get excited because this is how things happen. And this is really the last spot between you and a building permit. Once something is in the permitted use range, it's an entitlement for all intents and purposes. Uh, people have the right to go get a building permit. There are conditions, of course, that go along with that. A use permit is a discretionary act, which would trigger CEQA, uh, which is our environmental process, but also gives the town discretion to say yes or no. No is the most unused tool of a council and commission, uh, and frankly should be used a great deal more. Um, but you can see all these uses are on here. So I, I don't want to derail the committee uh, and, and get you looking at zoning when um, we'd rather you look at a higher picture, but this is where you can find all the nitty gritty detail that applies to the town. And you asked about residential density um, within mixed use. Yes. Yeah. So it, it floats back down to um, Zoning Code Chapter 1342-140, um, which provides maximum density when residential dwelling units are combined with office or retail commercial uses in a single building or on the same parcel, the maximum density shall be 15 dwell dwelling units per acre. And is that, what, where does the horizontal versus vertical come in? or the lack thereof. It's a lack thereof, so it's up to interpretation anytime a application comes in. And so, so if, if this one is not defined either in the general plan, in the policies, or in the zoning code. So it's something we need to think about. So Anders, can you just <clears throat> rephrase that whole topic again for us so we can noodle on it? Yeah, uh, basically the topic is you you have the choice in mixed uses of going vertical, as Mark said, or horizontal. Horizontal being, say, a one-story building, but connected. Uh, vertical, definitely, then you have different uses on top of each other. Uh, one of the, I, I think Mark or Mary Beth mentioned, typically it's commercial and then residential, but in a number of communities, it's the first layer is commercial, second layer is business office, and then the third layer is residential. So that's, but anyway, the, going back to this policy and nothing in the zoning code discusses if the expectation is vertical integration or horizontal integration or either. It, it's silent on that. So basically an applicant coming in can propose either given the way this the, the town plan and code is written at the present time. You can do either. And in your opinion, you were saying that the horizontal could potentially be a, a, a problem. I don't know if it is. It, it really depends on the project being proposed. Um, I noticed in their uh, religious uh, uses are one of them. And you know, if you had a, a tall church building, you're not probably going to have something on top of it. But I could see some residential uses attached to the church building, especially if you want to provide for housing for uh, special needs people, things like that. So there, you know, I think uh, vertical and horizontal both work. Okay, Jean has her hand up. Um, I have a question, I guess it's the legal question. The new regulation on to call it mixed use 
uh, says that two thirds of the use has to be for residential. Would that apply here? Or um, can we also use less than the two thirds if it does apply and just not use the term mixed use, just call it something else? If you're going to call it as part of your uh, regional housing needs assessment, uh, then it has to meet the state requirements for that. Um, but you have complete discretion to call mixed use whatever you'd like. Okay, so we don't have to, as long as it's not part of our RENA um, numbers, then, then it doesn't matter. That's correct, Gene. Okay, thank you. And Mark, on the RENA numbers, is that only for the low and very low, or is that also, uh, you know, the moderate income? I can't recall. I'm going to have to plead the fifth on that, Andy, because housing elements give me hives. And um, yeah, I see Lucy's on. Lucy, do you know? So you can't, it doesn't matter for low versus moderate and above moderate, as long as you're not removing the ability to construct that amount of density. So as long as you maintain the density, we're okay. Okay. All right. And I will add that the, the uh, California building code, which is what everybody uses to construct, isn't particularly friendly for mixed use developments because they have things called different use types. So vertical mixed use is very expensive. If you have different use types on the bottom floor than the top floor, you often have to have a great deal more uh, development cost associated with those. So if you're going to prohibit horizontal mixed use, then uh, and, and require vertical mixed use, you may never see it. That may not matter to the town and that's fine, but if that's something you want, uh, typically I only see those being successful um, in, in larger projects because they can spread the cost over. And that seems to be antithetical to what I've been hearing from the subcommittees. You don't want behemoth projects. You'd rather have smaller sort of types of projects. But that's perhaps a discussion for the subcommittee. Do you want larger or, or smaller projects? Do you want types of uses to be considered? I mean, would you be okay if on the same property there was commercial, residential, professional office all within the same complex or campus, if you will? Uh, that we're starting to see a lot of that with a redo of existing commercial centers. So you have a 1970-esque strip mall that has room to have apartments near or on top of it or as part of it. And we're starting to see those uses to come together in, in admittedly more urban areas where they have a lot of these uh, to, to pull that together. So is that something you'd be okay with? Something to think about. I think in this particular context, um, the, the subcommittee seems to be looking for tourist oriented things near the freeway and then you know whatever else can, can go or make sense behind it. But um, anyway. I'll shut up again. I think the only thing that would might be beneficial at this point is the history of the tourist destination commercial. I know we touched on it last week, but um, for the committee, um, would you be interested in hearing about um, basically the story behind tourist destination commercial? Because there there is one, and we have several people here on the committee that can can tell that story. Will you be interested in that? Jan, I think that would be very helpful. And then after that, if the committee could just discuss what would they like to see there, what in their minds, because then Mark can listen to it and say, okay, these are the kinds of uses that might be added to this description. So I think the history is really important to, to begin that discussion. Okay. Miguel, go ahead. Do I get to be the historian? Yes. Okay, way back when, before there was a town of Loomis, um, in the general plan, I believe, of the county, this was designated highway commercial. And it stayed that way. Um, when the town was incorporated, that zoning became part of the general plan. And then in 1980, well, in the 80s, there was a plan to develop a major commercial shopping center there by Dave Rosenauer. And it was very similar to what you see down by Vacaville. It was going to be basically 300,000 square feet of commercial. That, and Dave had basically come up with a, oh, shoot, why can't I think of it? He 
had a ballot measure that would allow the developer to create all the type of zoning uh, that the property needed, the height of the buildings, the design, um, very similar to what uh, was going to go in behind, uh, not what was going to go in, but the method that was going to be used behind Rayleigh's, uh, I forget what it's called, but it preempted the town from any control over the building. So that measure went on a ballot before the public and the public turned down that request. Um, so that property continued to be highway commercial. And I guess until now it became, well, then later decided to change it to tourist commercial. In other words, the idea was that people that would come off the freeway would stop there for gas or shops or a variety of things, but basically because they were um, coming off the freeway, it was to track the people off the freeway. So some of these uses that are now being mentioned, uh, this is actually the first time I ever heard of those kinds of uses being uh, thought of on that property. So that's kind of a quick rundown on, and uh, Jean can help me with that too. Yeah, Jean, go ahead. Um, well, Miguel has, has uh, there was a step in between. I don't know what it was from the county, so I'll assume that it was highway commercial, but when, at the time that we were looking at the previous general plan, it had was not commercial. That whole area was RE residential estate, 2.3 acres. And there was, I think it was an initiative um, to, to make it tourist commercial along that area and, and change it from RE to the commercial tourist commercial, attract the highway people to, to, to um, Basically, the, uh, the inelegant slogan was car tops, not rooftops. In other words, don't build out a whole lot of, don't build out residential over there. Residential costs money uh, compared to commercial brings in money. And it was thought it would give jobs as well as um, the income to the town from sales tax revenue. And this was before uh, the, the uh, Turtle Island project was brought forth. This was put into the general plan by vote of the voters about two thirds. It passed very highly. So that's when it went, went to from RE, residential estates, to tourist commercial. And then that project, the uh, Dave Rosenauer, Karen Fox project did come in with a lot of um, a lot of things that probably we can talk about when we have more detail if we're going to do history of it, but that's just a general look at, at the history of, uh, of the change from residential estate, feeling that the town really could use that area to bring in income and give jobs. And I know that <clears throat> I've heard the comments again already about, well, we shouldn't have competition between the downtown and and create a competition over on Turtle Island, uh, that area. But when this was discussed before, when Turtle Island was being looked at, um, the interesting thing is that's not what the downtown people said. The downtown people were not saying, we don't want Turtle Island, it's too much commercial, it's gonna com compete. Instead, they were saying, some of those people are going to come across the bridge and come downtown. Not all of them, not 100%, maybe 5%, maybe 10%, depending on how it's marketed between downtown and Turtle Island, uh, what we have downtown, whether people are staying in a hotel or something like that, or, or the equestrian actually was proposed for a livery to be there and there is a uh, equestrian facility allowed. Um, so before we decide for the downtown people that they don't want it, maybe we need to find out if they consider it still uh, too competitive or whether it would actually contribute as they seem to think uh, when we looked at this before. 
Okay, enough for now. <laughs> okay, I can't see if anybody else has their hand up. Ramona. No, no hand, oh, Ramona, yes, go ahead, Ramona. Okay, yeah, um, so along with what Jean was saying, um, yeah, I think it really would depend on the type of commercial that uh, might go in on Turtle Island as a destination area. Um, you know, the, the whole historic Main Street program was developed to address just that, that developments and commercial businesses cropping up on the outskirts of towns really did um, shoot a hole into the viability and the um, visitation of people going to the traditional downtown areas. Um, so, you know, in this case, it, it could have the potential to draw people into the downtown. It just depends on what the commercial use would be. You know, if it's something like a fountains with shopping and dining, I'd say, no, that's gonna really impact your downtown area that has the vibrancy of, of the dining already going on and some, you know, smaller shops. But if you're attracting people for a different reason to be there, whether kind of more of a tourist in a sense of an activity or a hotel, you know, bed and breakfast kind of thing, that that would then funnel people into your downtown because they're looking for something to do besides just whatever it is that brought them to the commercial that was built across the highway. So, you know, it would just have to be a matter of uh, how would you, uh, how would you change anything, if anything, uh, to promote the uses that would be compatible with not undermining your downtown. Thank you for that, Ramona. Um, anybody else? Anything? Is Bonnie, Bonnie, do you want to add anything? Sure. Um, so, so I did send some things in because I wanted to understand Turtle Island a little bit better. And just to kind of add to what both Miguel and Jean said, um, you know, essentially uh, it was originally um, agricultural land. Um, I didn't see that it was uh, uh, residential estates, um, but the town did have an initiative advising for commercial development in 92. And the problem was that the town council apparently just had some difficulty ever getting to the place to actually zoning for the commercial. And so that's when in 98, um, the owners of the land put up the initiative to try to rezone to commercial um, and the, the um, opposing measure was that the town council wanted the final approval to rezone and that is what actually won um, what Turtle Island was proposing was 500 square feet of shopping and office, half retail offices, amphitheater and art gallery. Um, and then in 2001, when the town general plan um, was done, that was when it was formally rezoned to commercial destination. Um, the things that I was looking at. So then I was trying to get out of the weeds and just trying to get, you know, that 300, you know, foot overview of what, you know, I, I think would be appropriate. I think what, what was really guiding my decision was, or some of my ideas was actually the market analysis that I think Mary Beth might've put in our chat the last time around, but it's in the general plan documents. And interestingly, you know, again, I think we've always heard the argument that, um, we wouldn't be able to absorb a whole lot of commercial just because there's so much commercial down in Roseville and in Rockland um, that you know there's just too much competition. But when you look at the market analysis, it actually says you know we're we're pretty much underwater. We don't have enough of um, the retail or office or industrial. Um, and you know it got me thinking also over to Highway 50 where you have um, you know intensive amount of, of retail in Folsom on every single exit. Um, but El Dorado Hills, you've got the um, town center, which is actually quite thriving. I mean, it's a scale that we would never, you know, want. Um, the Turtle Island parcel, I believe, is only about 64 acres, whereas town center is almost twice as that. Um, but with, with all of that commercial, there's still 
there's still a market for it. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, in our industrial, you know, if we're, we're looking at our land uses and I'm now I'm kind of got the way big picture because of the general plan um, or the general land use oversight of all of the different subcommittees. I don't know where we would put more industrial, but I do know that in our industrial space, we have a lot of built businesses there that probably don't belong there, but they had nowhere else to go. And so if we start pulling some of those out by providing spaces for them, and I'm thinking specifically of like McLaughlin or um, the gymnastics center or some of those training facilities, um, you know, being able to put them in, in other spaces, then that would open up some of the industrial. The other thing that that might do is my daughter was in the gymnastics and McLaughlin, and I would see the majority of the other students weren't actually from Loomis. They were coming in from Rockland and Roseville and, and outside of the area. But in order to get to the Sweatser, they've got to drive through town. And so again, if those sites are located, you know, on some of the, the periphery or off of the freeway, that might also, you know, kind of, um, you know, take some of those that, you know, through town traffic off and, and keep them on the edges as well, since we know that traffic is a, a big problem here. So anyways, that was a lot of information. <laughs> No, it's all excellent information. We all need to hear what you are all saying. Um, one thing that just stuck out to me though, as I'm reading the general plan right now, is this um, tourist destination commercial has actually 117 contiguous acres. Um, and so obviously um, different parcels that go run along that, all along that freeway zone. Is there anybody else that has their hand up on our committee? No, not at this time. And I just wanted to um, let everybody know I've posted the link for the market analysis in the chat uh, for easy retrieval. Okay. Bonnie brought up something that the committee may want to discuss. This, this, this doesn't not describe basically commercial recreation. And I know there are some communities, some of that commercial recreation, which is quite a draw, is uh, soccer fields, baseball fields, et cetera, with the uh, attached commercial. And, and right now I don't see that this would allow such a thing to occur. So it's something to, to think about. That's a really good point. Um, and I see Jean and Jean and then, Jean and then Miguel. Um, I think one of the considerations is this backs up to not just the creek, but all the resi rural residential areas behind it. So uh, anything that's going to create a lot of noise is probably not going to be very welcomed by all the people that live back there. Um, when it was proposed for an amphitheater, the idea was not to have rock concerts, but, uh, but more like the theater kind of um, to have you know, quieter sorts of things, not to blast things across the creek. And frankly, as much as we might love kids' soccer games, they're not very quiet. And I don't, I don't know how well that would go across. We do, I think, need to keep the, the neighbors in mind. Um, I have other comments or questions, but they're not about this part about Turtle Island. So if we're gonna have a later discussion, I can hold those off or if we're finished with Turtle Island for now, after Miguel's comment and any others, then I'll come that, back yeah. for a few other things. Okay, Miguel. Yeah, one of, one of the major things we need to consider is ingress and egress. I mean, it's limited by the horseshoe bar on and off ramp. And when we talk about what's gonna be developed there, we need to see how much traffic can that on and off ramp can really handle because the off ramp right now at times is getting backed up. And uh, so that's the thing that has to be considered before you really come up with what kind of land use could be in there. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. Have we um, exhausted the subject of Turtle Island for now? Anybody else have any? Oh, Ramona. Yeah, I just wanted to make one more um, comment, just kind of in general um, with 
the downtown area is, you know, like Bonnie said, bringing some of the things that are at Switzer out more into something would be more visible for people to utilize like McLaughlin or a gymnasium instead of hiding it in an industrial area. Um, just to, you know, I, I understand that and I agree with that, uh, but there's, there's a fair amount of, you know, totally underutilized land along our downtown area or in our downtown area. So just keep that in mind that, you know, as we're wanting to, um, you know, as the market analysis is that, that there can be more commercial and there should be commercial, more commercial. I'm not, you know, the, the residential to commercial and industrial mix seems pretty high on the residential end. I mean, I, I don't think there's ever really a rule of thumb, but um, it seems like it's a little bit on the higher side, but um, you know, there's a lot of underutilized land uh, in already that would be considered like infill in our downtown area. Okay. Anybody else? So let's go then move south from there. Uh, Jean, I know you had some things going on with our. Madam Chair, would you like to open it up a uh, Turtle Island discussion to public attendees before we move forward? Sure. Let's do that. Okay. Any participating attendees uh, that are out in the audience, if you'd wish to talk about Turtle Island, please raise your hand. They will remain silent. We may proceed. Okay. Jean. You're muted, Jean. Okay. A, a final comment on that, then on Turtle Island. Well, um, one of the big problems before was that there was no sewer line over there. That was a major uh, hindrance. And now the sewer line goes directly through Turtle Island. So that side of things will be easier to develop. The other hang up was how much traffic could that overpass handle? And maybe if the infrastructure bill goes through federally, we should see um, how much of that we might be able to get for something, our, our needs here. Okay, so uh, if we could go to, oh, all right, we've got the land use map. Just mm -hmm. a couple of little points on here that might be helpful background. One is that those, um, the yellow RE that's right next to Turtle Island was previously primarily R, I think it maybe was all RA 4.6. And at the time of the uh, previous general plan, the people, some of the people that live there came and said, hey, we don't have 4.6 acre parcels are only like a couple in there they're really a lot smaller than that. And so because the people came and sh could show um, that they really didn't have that size parcel, then they were allowed to, um, to get it changed to RE basically to fit the way it mostly was. And if you wonder about why are there here and there some one acre parcels in both the RE and the RA around town goes back to the county and I was told it's because the county used to require one acre parcel in order to have a septic system. Over time, they found that that was not adequate and, and septics were, uh, the systems were wearing out and the people didn't have enough space for, uh, for the uh, reserve uh, leach fields. So they stopped allowing that, but that's why we have some of those little one acre parcels stuck in here and there in our, our, our more rural areas. Um, okay, and, and, and we, have, we require now 4 point, no, 2.3 acres before you can have a septic system. So that's in our regulations. Uh, let's see. Oh, I was thinking about, la I looked over the minutes from last time and, and there was mention of um, some equestrian uh, uses and you'll notice on the, or there is equestrian use allowed on this property, the Turtle Island property. And something that uh, was gonna be proposed was a livery area um, so that people traveling 
could stop with their horses and have one of the more remote areas of, of the property kind of away from things. Um, unless you're a horse person, you probably don't realize that people that are traveling like to go to shows and, and other gatherings are on the highway and they can use a place to stop over for the night, park their trailers, have their horses uh, fed and watered and um, maybe have some exercise space. And if we want to figure out more on that, we might want to talk to somebody from the Loomis Basin Horsemen's Association, which is quite active in this area. And their, um, their arena is just over the bridge in, in the uh, Loomis Basin Park, um, just very near here. So if there were people traveling and they were going to go something there or something further along the highway, that was why that had a livery um, proposed. We don't think of that, you know, you, old movies, you had livery stables, but there's still a need for it sometimes. Okay, a comment on the map. Um, along Barton Road, let's see. Along Barton Road, the north side of Barton Road is not all RE. The yellow, it should have a little patch that shows it's 4.6 because if you look at the general plan, the, the way it reads is to keep the rural uh, look of, of, um, of things as people come into town, come into the rural part of Loomis along Rockland Road, that the parcels facing Rockland Road should be 4.6 and the parcels behind it would be 2.3 or the yellow. So I think that probably, I don't know how that, why it isn't in there as, as, as that, but that is in our general plan. That's where um, a couple of churches are and Poppy Ridge, um, the original Poppy Ridge and a couple of other parcels, but they're requ required to be 4.6, not, not the 2.3, if they're facing Barton Road. So, so just for everybody's point of reference, I believe, Jean, you're talking about that the big yellow square there, right? Um, and if somebody could just kind of point out what, what she's talking about. So if you can find Rockland Road coming into town and going, at, going to Barton, Okay, so right there. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I suppose it's somewhere along there. It should should show that it should be four point six instead of the four yeah. the R E instead of yeah. It, it's not a major thing, um, except if you own that property, <laughs> you do have that restriction. Uh, let's see. Mark did call that out in, in his slide presentation um, as a residential estate designation northwest of Rockland and Barton Roads. And this is policy specific to this area. Um, it right. says proposed subdivisions shall be designed to provide parcels with a minimum 4.6 acres along Barton Road, uh, along Barton and Rockland Road frontages and a minimum of 2.3 when located away from Barton and Rockland Roads. Okay, so what that means is it's, it's still designated 2.3, but you're not allowed to build 2.3. You're only allowed to do 4.6. Is that what you're saying? That would be how I would interpret it. Yeah. Okay. So, it's, so is, is, this is the policy I think we're talking about. And so if you have a larger property, say you had 12 or 15 acres, the, the pieces of pro, uh, that, were, that were along Barton and Rockland would have to be, if you were to subdivide, had to be 4.6, and then the rest of the property could be at 2.3. Okay. But um, this, this is a gotcha. Um, this is a, oops, uh, type of thing that I, I, I literally try to make sure never happens in a general plan. If we want 4.6 along Barton Road and Rockland Road, then for heaven's sakes, let's put it on the stupid map because people will look at the map and they will not read the text. And this only comes up at the meeting when somebody smart like you, Gene, says, 
hey, did you bother to read page 12? And everybody looks really sheepish and, and feels silly at that point. So this is the type of thing that should have been on the map. So if this is something that the, uh, the town wants, then for heaven's sakes, let's put it on, this, on the map so we can find it. Okay, and it and and the the um, I think the the language was it was to preserve the rural atmosphere was why that was done along there. Fair, fair um, enough, um, and and please understand that sometimes we truncate the text that's in the general plan because adding a page and a half and a PowerPoint slide might not necessarily oh, be helpful. No, no, I'm I wasn't wasn't yeah. critiquing that. It was just yeah. Yeah. because well, I actually, went. I went over this stuff this afternoon before the meeting and, and so I noted it. Okay, I think that was, that was just kind of some background stuff I was thinking might be helpful to some people. You are okay. awesome, Jean, thank you so very much. And, and, and Lucy, we will flag this because I don't want to see this sort of stuff in the general plan unless it's backed up on this picture. Here. Yeah, I've got it, I noted it. Okay, anybody else? Oh, Bonnie. Did we ever get the updated um, map with vacant lots or vacant sites? Because I know the previous map showed a lot of vacant sites down below, but I'm wondering if with the update, there were fewer? Yes, the, the vacant sites inventory map is currently, I think this afternoon it will be finalized um, and ready to roll, but we did address all parcels and corrected them and there are much less vacant parcels. There, there are many underutilized parcels, um, but a lot fewer vacant parcels. Okay, um, I guess my, my comment to, when in the general plan, when it says you wanna maintain the rural look and character, um, I think that maybe we need to be more specific about that. And the reason being, you know, it, what comes to my mind is um, Sierra de Montserrat, which um, I believe they wanted to make sure that it stayed the 4.6 acres, again, to maintain that rural character and feel. But if you were to go drive down um, Rutherford Canyon, it doesn't necessarily look, you know, rural to me um, in my mind. Um, and, you know, I believe that it had been proposed to cluster that area into 2.2 acre lots and preserve a lot more open space that would have been able to be used for trails. Um, and so I just wonder again, if it's just something to, to think about if the, the whole point of maintaining that 4.6 was specifically just to have a rural look and feel, I'm wondering if we need to add more specificity so that, um, Indeed, it does maintain a rural feel as opposed to, you know, something that's, you know, looks a little bit more shishi or, you know, different than in rural. Andy, what do you think about that? Um, I think it's worthwhile discussion because you can cluster and, and then provide for that rural feel, the trails, whatever. So, uh, you know, Mark, let's talk about that in the land use element, but. Some of that, I think, might be an overall uh, goal policy in the land use element. And then what we need to do is how do we implement that as part of the implementation program? And then do we have to get the HOA involved in that? Uh, if, if it's an existing HOA, absolutely. They're going, yeah, they're going to have a say. Yeah. But I thought that was already subdivided, Mary Beth. So if it's already subdivided, unless somebody's coming in and re-subdividing. No, that, that one's a done deal. That one was, yeah. Okay. yeah. I'm, I'm just okay. thinking of future uses of yeah. the whatever remaining vacant sites there are. Um, Jean has her hand up. Uh, we did have one, one small cluster development and unfortunately it fell through um, probably with, with the recession. And that was over on Saunders we do provide in our zoning ordinance for clustered development. Uh, that was a small one. I think it was a 10 acre or so site and had, uh, I don't remember now, half a dozen homes, but to preserve some wetlands, we did allow them to uh, some modifications and clustered it. But when it was proposed for Turtle Island, um, 
basically the South Siders rose up in mass and opposed it extremely, extremely strongly because they felt to put a cluster was not going to preserve the rural feeling and it would lead to more and more clustering on the south side. So um, basically you're gonna have to persuade a whole lot of people that live in the, in the rural areas that they want to have that. Otherwise they are not gonna be persuaded that, um, that they want to see things. I don't remember that they were going to have that big a parcel. And what, how it was done there was, uh, yes, people have 4.6 acre parcels and yes, they're kind of, you know, it doesn't necessarily have the same ambiance as going by a, uh, a farm kind of, farm kind of place, but it did allow them to put in, uh, I forget 60 acres or something of vineyard plus I don't remember how Bonnie might know how how many acres of uh, pres preserved oh oh er preserved area. Uh, what do you call it? The open space. The well, the ones that are pre preservation areas, mm -hmm. and a lot of the parcels, if not all of them, have part of their parcel is either in vineyard, which is an agricultural preserve or it's in, in the, wild, uh, not wilderness, but a, a, a nature preserve kind of thing. And so that was kind of a special case for, for that area. Um, I agree with Bonnie, you know, to drive through there, it doesn't look as rural as, as some of the other places do, but I, I think you've got an uphill battle to persuade the rural areas that they want to have uh, a clustered area, which to them may not feel very rural. Okay, real quickly, what's rural? Mm -hmm. I was just going to ask, what is that? <laughs> I know what I, I know what I think it is. I mean, I look out my back window, and I'm not looking at the golf course. I'm looking at my back window, and it is definitely rural. Because a 4.6 acre lot is not rural to me. It's just too small to farm and too big to mow. But that's me uh, because I've come from areas where you know rural was 100 plus acres. Several people lived on 600 acre spots. That was rural to me, but I lived in a different part of the world. So what does rural mean to the town? This is vital stuff because if we're gonna say that it has to be rural, then we need to be able to explain that to people. So do we have something that we consider rural? Is it long setbacks? Is it distance between buildings? Is it building heights? Is it coverage? You have to have a goat. What, what is it? I like goats, by the way. Uh, you have to have a goat. What, what is it you, what does the town say? By golly, that's rural. I get a lot of definitions of what isn't rural and it happens to be whatever somebody doesn't like. So help me out here. Okay. Miguel? Actually, uh, let me, let me, Anders. One of, yeah, one of the things that uh, is getting ready to be published is the uh, social pinpoint site. And on there, one of the questions that is asked for people to address is you can pinpoint what is rural on a map or you can describe it. Um, and I think, Mark, one of the things we need to do is absolutely define what rural means for the town of Loomis, and I think we need to maybe look at some other uh, codes and ordinances and, and plans to see what that means. I know in some towns it's uh, no curves and gutters, just swales just next to the road, the setbacks. I mean, there's a lot of things that could make, you know, people say, hey, this is rural. So I think given the town of Loomis, you know, uh, I mean, 98% of the people who responded to the first two questions about Loomis in the Shell survey 98% was we want to be rural. And therefore, I think that's absolutely essential that we define what rural is for Loomis. Uh, before we go on, I know there's a lot of hands up, but if you look at our general plan under residential agriculture, um, it says this land use designation is key in maintaining the rural character of Loomis 
and is appropriate for agricultural uses such as orchards, nurseries, and vineyards, cattle grazing, and very low density. And I know that we're just talking about residential ag, but I think it might be important to you for the committee to read this section of the general plan because rural is mentioned a lot and it always with descriptive, um, some descriptive words. And I, I totally think we should put it out there to the social pinpoint to see, but um, in the meantime, let's, uh, I'm not sure whose hand was first. Ramona. Ramona. All right. Yeah. I'm just kind of going along that. I, I think, yeah, I think it'll be, um, Basically, you know, it's the appearance of rural. Yes, 4.6 isn't very large, um, but you can have a very big difference between 4.6 acres and Montserrat. It tends to be very manicured and sculpted looking, I guess, if we want to call it that, um, compared to, say, other 4.6 acres, um, even including mine that even though it's a little more manicured looking, it still is very rural and farm looking. We actually do have a farm. Um, so it's a very small farm, but, you know, I, I think it kind of goes along that line of, you know, curbs and gutters, probably not, um, some other kind of, you know, if there's trails, that's fine, but nothing that looks like it's been sculpted by, um, a, a developers too much, I think is, is kind of the way I kind of view that what people are thinking about when they want it to be rural looking or maintaining rural is that, it hasn't been so heavily um, designed and sculpted by um, developers, uh, you know, where, where it's not that, you know, that, that it totally gets more to the organic look rather than pushing it towards a, a very um, uh, formalized, and I wouldn't want to say cookie cutter, but, you know, you kind of get that idea, right? You go from very organic designs and, uh, vernacular all the way to cookie cutter, you know, so even though the size of the parcels is small, um, I hope that makes sense that the, the aesthetic is that it is more vernacular in style and, and not um, manufactured. How's that? Well said. So you would say natural grade versus artificial grade, and you would say, um, for want of a better word, eclectic rather than formulaic. Yes. All right. All right, who's next? Maybe Actually, back. real quick, quick on that. Photographs of what you think is rural would be helpful because we can interpret that and put it into text. Okay. Um, Miguel, you're next. Miguel? You're on mute, Miguel. Sorry. Okay. How about now? Yes. Here. Okay, uh, a couple things that I think add to the rural look, and I've probably driven 500 or 700 miles around Loomis and Penryn and Newcastle th through the back roads. I think one is setbacks, that you can't, the rural properties, the front of it is, is basically open. I think the other one that I noticed is open fences. There, there you can see the land, uh, if you drive down Sierra College and Brace and the different uh, roads around uh, Loomis, that is you know wide open agriculture. While 4.6 may not be you know 100 acre farmland, it does give the impression of at least my feeling of being rural. As far as Montserrat, I guess there's a difference of opinion. If the houses weren't so extensive and you had all those vineyards, you'd say, yeah, this is real rural, you're in Napa. It's, I think the houses, even though they're limited to one acre parcel to uh, footprint, you know, they're massive. So they take away from the vineyards, which are you know, real extensive. So you're right, it doesn't really look agricultural. It's probably more manicured, but there is a lot of agriculture in Montserrat. But I, again, I think the setbacks and the fact that it's open, yet you can see as you drive along the grasslands. And again, that it's, uh, as pointed out, the elevations are basically maintained. Thanks. That was awesome. Uh, large setbacks, opening clear view onto the property. And, and this is a great one, ratio of home to parcel size. We talk a little bit about that in the current general plan. 
but that really does speak to uh, making sure you're not building a McMansion. And please understand, I meant no disrespect to the 4.6 acres. I'd love to have 4.6 acres. Uh, it was just putting it in context of what people from not the town might consider. Jean? Oh, there you go. Am I still muted? No, nope, we can hear. Nope, now you're muted. All right, I'm back? Yep, we're yeah. back. Okay, I, I agree with all, all these things that have been said. Uh, they're very helpful. I would like to add that part of it is kind of hinted at, but it's the open space that people see when they go by. Now, I was a little disappointed when we had the open space meeting that open space for that purpose is only conservation of, of more like wild areas for that kind of you know specific preservation. But I think if you were to ask that uh, the ordinary person in Loomis, well, what do you think of when you think of open space, they would not be thinking specifically of a preserved natural area that you're trying to conserve uh, species habitat and things like that. I think they would, they would basically say, well, having a large areas that you can go through, go drive by that are not all developed into, uh, into housing and businesses. In other words, it's kind of, um, a lot of space between development, between homes. Be now across the street, we have three three homes on old one acre lots, but across the street we're on 4.6. So it doesn't make it feel like um, it's non-rural because it still, it still uh, has that open space feeling. And we have the trees along Barton Road, which unfortunately will have to probably go out if they put in bike lanes, which are uh, probably needed because of the hazard of, of driving here, riding here. But I think it's that open space feel, and I don't know a better term to use for that since if, if, if we have to reserve open space terminology for the conservation element kind of definition. But I think that's what people are looking for is um, space that is open to agriculture or yards, um, just trees, areas that they can go through that don't feel like they're all built up and developed um, with, with buildings, I think, particularly. Uh, I don't know if that's helpful, but maybe we can get our get our hands around that concept somehow a little better. Yeah. From a planning perspective, Gene, that is incredibly helpful because we can regulate the distance between buildings. That is something that can be done both through the general plan and through the ultimate zoning uh, code. That is a very helpful uh, thing that you said there and it's perfectly in line with all of the other points, uh, Madam Chair. The only thing that I would point out is the accessory dwelling units and their new um, setback laws with them. That That is kind of a, con, you know, it's four, four feet from what I... Well, let, let's, let's, be, let's be clear that we're talking about buildings on separate parcels because most farms have buildings that are close to each other on their property um, because most of the farmers I know don't want to walk all that far at two in the morning to feed the cows or the pigs. So they have it relatively close by or, or within. So it's okay to have a little cluster of buildings. In fact, I would say that that adds to the rural feel, but between properties, you don't want all those things clustered at once maybe, but between properties that would preserve the open space and the view shed. Apparently I can't just tell you, I have to show you. Uh, the view sheds between the buildings uh, and between the properties would seem to get to that rural uh, flavor. At least it makes perfect sense in my brain. Uh, and it's something we could both illustrate and it's something that can be regulated. And it, it wouldn't run afoul of the ADU stuff. Well, I think it's four feet from the fence on ADUs. Yeah, but if you stipulate that you have a setback of a specific distance um, and you require that the main house be placed in the middle, somebody's unlikely to place an ADU four feet and 130 feet from the house. Just if we make it harder for people to do, they'll do the simple thing, usually. I see Eden Lee's hand up. There we go. Can you guys hear me? 
Yes. Um, so going back to the definition about what's rural, especially here in California, uh, University of California's uh, California Communities Program did a study of what being rural meant uh, to California. Um, it's a it's a PDF file that, that I pulled up um, and I can share that with you guys. It's it's fascinating because basically in, in a nutshell from a uh, with with my career as a land agent, anything that's not uh, incorporated in an urban or a suburban area is considered rural. So um, I, I guess technically we could call most of Lu like downtown Loomis because there's sidewalks and, and whatnot as, as potentially urban or suburban and everything beyond that would be considered rural as far as, as, as far as what this study shows. Um, something else that we might want to consider too, though, is that as we're going forward with, um, with basically with, with how the social uh, uh, with, with how everything is socially working right now uh, in, in this country, we might want to help redefine what rural means because rural, according to the University of California, is apparently homogenous, mostly white, mostly uh, service oriented. And so we might want to consider help moving that uh, definition in, in, into the future and being a little bit more inclusive about that. So really good point. Thank you, Eden. You basically, what is happening is because we have these large parcels and they're only affordable, obviously, to people that can afford them and they're very, very expensive. And so in that in itself is causing um, causing communities maybe not to be as diverse as as would be nice. Um, anybody else got their hands up? Is there anybody in the public? Are we ready for public comment? Yes. Okay. No hands are raised. All right. Oh, Jean? Am I unmuted? Yes, ma'am. Okay, this is this is um, on your land, the vacant land, and I, I could not find that map. I, I'm sure it's somewhere, but I didn't find it. I just wanted to make sure that the parcel between the golf course and um, the one right north of the golf course was showing. The last map I saw was showing as vacant, and that house has been there a few years. Carol would remember it's the house that went in. Um, it was a prefab house brought in in a few pieces, like three pieces, um, and put up um, with a, it was brought in and just assembled like in a day. So I know that's been there. And I, I don't know if it got corrected on your vacant, vacant land map, just if you could check that before the final one goes in, if you don't know. Is that the one between us, Jean? Yes, the one just north of the driving range. Yeah, that actually is an incredible modular home. That home is completely environmentally friendly. I, have, I don't know if anybody's had it's, it. You can it barely, it's green. And so when you barely can see it when you drive by, but the gentleman that lives there is an engineer, I believe. And, 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 and they were very thoughtful, I think, about um, what they were choosing. And, and um, I don't know, it was, you know, at first you, I'll just say, you know, I was intrigued uh, by it. But it's a Bay Area company, I believe, that made that that modular home. Have you been inside? Yes. Dan? Yes. It's fantastic inside. You would never guess from the outside look of that, the very simple look of the outside. You'd never guess what a lovely house it is on the inside and how well thought out. So yep. those modular homes really can you know, they, they really can work. And that it was just assembled in like a day or two. They brought it in, things were craned in. We watched the cranes lifting the pieces of the house down into place and put them together and that was done. Yeah, it was phenomenal for sure. All right, any, any what else, what's left on our 
haven't looked back at our agenda in a long time. Let's see. All right, so we are now sort of at a direction. We've certainly talked about a lot of things and we're going to be getting um, the open land vacant map that has not been put on yet, Gene, so we, we will get that put up. Um, I think Mark said he was gonna, he's been reaching out to Vacaville, I believe he said, for a project that we talked about the time before. We're going to attempt to get our, our community to define what rural means to, to, to them. Um, Eden, it would be good if you could give us that PDF that you're looking at. I think that would be interesting maybe to post that to our chat. Um, I can do that. Thank you. Uh, I think it's been really great for us to discuss um, that uh, tourist destination and its history. And we've sort of really are wrapping our, our minds around that. Um, we will be considering the vertical versus horizontal um, depiction. And let's see, Mark asked us to look at other general plans, um, maybe that we might uh, look at some towns that are similar to us in size or that we might find attractive about them. Um, oh, I see Miguel's hands up. Miguel? Yes. Hold on. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Question is the horse motel, is that the one down in Vacaville that used to be a motel? Then it kind of closed and then it be reopened as a motel with stables. Is that the one where that he's talking about? Looks like yes, he's sir. yes, sir. Oh, okay. Yeah, that used to be a motel and then it they change it over to a horse motel. So it's been there a while. Um, my only other comment basically is, as far as I'm concerned, we should just leave the zoning the way it is here. So thank you and have a good afternoon. Thank you, Miguel. <laughs> I think Jean uh, also wanted to maybe reach out um, to the Loomis Horse or space in the equine people. Um, Jean, do you have a connection there? Or do you want Mary Beth to reach out? I, I don't have a connection, no. Um, I have somebody that might be able to help us with that. I will, I will, I will reach out. Okay. Um, Bonnie has her hand raised. Bonnie? Um, yeah, I think, I think the other thing in consideration of this um, subcommittee is when we can get the total acres of park space that we currently have and how much we need to be, um, I guess, in a, a line with the, what is it, five acres per thousand residents, um, that would be helpful. Um, that, and then I can also forward to Mary Beth, um, Roger, our town treasurer, has a slide set that um, I thought was really interesting and he made, the case that with the fiscalization of land use, um, a you know um, a ten million dollar um, investment in homes, because we only get what percent of that yields about a th eleven thousand dollars to the town, versus ten million in sales equals a hundred thousand to the town, versus. Um, a $10 million hotel project of 60 rooms at 100 per night and only half <laughs> occupancy throughout the year. Um, but because of the TOT would then yield a minimum of like over 300,000 to the town. So it was just an interesting comparison of what type of uses would um, generate different types of, um, of revenue, so. And good point, Bonnie, because I, I was talking to Mary Beth today and we are going to ask Roger to come and um, be with us next time and, and do that same presentation. Right, Mary Beth? Yes. Yes. At your next, um, actually, it's at the Northwest I-80 Horseshoe Bar. Um, we can do it probably at both because that's an important thing. Um, I've also got Roger scheduled um, with the, and, and this may be a better place if everybody can view it. 
Um, I've got Roger already scheduled to do that presentation at the M Economic Development and Finance Committee meeting. Uh, that's on May 4th at 6 o'clock. Uh, so even if you are not able to make that meeting, you know that all of our meetings are recorded on YouTube, and I'd be happy to send that link out after the meeting. Um, because it, it really is an interesting discussion from the finance side of life and town revenues and what yeah. we get for what we bang for our buck. Well, I think you and I were specifically talking about this committee, though, because of the tourist destination and the fact that it, hotels are allowed. OK, I'll, I'll correct that, Jan. I, I put an yeah. arrow to the northwest, so. All right. <laughs> OK. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. I mean, like I said, you were going to win the world's record for Zoom meetings, keeping us all straight. <laughs> Thank you. Miguel no, has one additional comment. Well, I don't know if it's one additional, but he has another comment. <laughs> you may unmute. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Um, there was a comment made about five acres per thousand. Uh, I talked to Jan about this, but just quickly, that whole park dedication fee is incorrect and in my personal opinion, illegal. So that whole thing has to be worked over. But you might want to look at the is it 2010 or 12 park and recreation element that was never developed and it'll answer a lot of your questions. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? I just want to make sure we have everything else that we're all right. All right. Are we ready to adjourn, everybody? All right. Thank you so much again. I appreciate everybody's everybody's second that they were able to be with us and all the wonderful information that we were able to share with each other and all the history. It's um, invaluable. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a lovely, lovely evening. And thank you, Mary Beth. And thank you. Mark and everybody else, all of the people that, and I can't see you because I only have five. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Thank you everybody uh, for tonight and, and your participation. See you next, see you in a month. Or some of you might see me later because we're all in the same committees. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks everybody. <laughs>